guys, and welcome to episode 175 of the OCDstories.com podcast. Now, this episode is sponsored by Unstuck, an OCD kids movie, and here is a quick mini interview with Chris, the producer of the film, to talk about Unstuck. So, what is Unstuck? Unstuck, an OCD kids movie, is an award winning short film that shares information and ideas from a kid's perspective. Six different kids talk about all their different OCD issues, and each one of them has a different type of OCD, and they talk about how it affected them, how it affected their family, and most importantly, how exposure response prevention therapy and dealing with OCD treatment worked for them and allowed them to kind of overcome their fears and get themselves in a much better place. Brilliant. And uh, why create it? Kelly Anderson and myself created Unstuck because we are both parents of children with OCD. So we wanted to create a resource that we would have wanted to see when we were first finding out about it to give people some hope and inspiration and also give people an idea of how uh, OCD treatment works with kids uh, because there's a lot of fear and nervousness with parents. And uh, we wanted to kind of give people something that was hopeful to look forward to. And what's sort of one message of hope for families of kids with OCD? My message of hope to any parent listening right now is that, or anyone less with OCD uh, or a loved one with OCD right now, is that um, they you can get better. There is ways that you can overcome your fears, fight your fears. It may take a long time, but you know you can stick with it, and you will be able to kind of get OCD in a place where it's not disrupting your life. And then, how can people get a copy of the film? You can see the film and get all our resources at OCDKidsMovie.com. You can stream it for 24 hours right on our website. Anybody can watch it. Uh, If you are a therapist or professional and you want to own the film for your practice or for your school or college, you can buy it from NewDayFilms.com. And uh, you can also stream it for free if if your college has the Canopy streaming platform. So there are a bunch of different ways to see it, but... uh, Um, Everything is listed on our website, OCDKidsMovie.com, along with all our resources and links out to other of our favorite uh, OCD websites. So check out OCDKidsMovie.com and, you know, you can get everything right there. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed that mini interview. And thanks to those guys for sponsoring the show. I've seen the film and I love it. I think it's great. So if you want to rent the film, you can do so. Just go to ocdkidsmovie.com. And if you're a therapist and you want to show it to all your clients, you can purchase the film. And if you use code APR19UNS, that's APR19UNS, you'll get 20% off when purchasing the film for your therapy practice. If you go to ocdkidsmovie.com, you'll find all the details there. In today's episode, I interview Mary Torres. Mary is a licensed mental health counsellor, and I wanted to get her on to talk about doing ERP groups, so that's exposure response prevention therapy within a group setting Uh, compared to say one-to-one when it's just you and the therapist and the reason I wanted to get her on is because she does several groups with people with OCD doing ERP within the groups and uh, it's not something we've talked about in detail on the podcast and I really wanted to give it an episode to expand further for those of you who are either in groups currently or who are considering doing group therapy Uh, and also for those that are in one-to-one therapy I think there's still lots of good information here that you'll enjoy. Uh, So we talk about how does ERP in groups differ from one-to-one therapy. Uh, We talk about how does it work, you know, doing all exposures simultaneously or does one person do it at a time and the others support them. Uh, I asked Mary about whether she mixes up the themes within the groups or keeps them, for example, just people with harm OCD or just people with religious OCD or is it a mix of all different themes. Uh, We talk about what are some of the benefits of doing group therapy uh, and how do other group members support the process and then any initial hesitations people have about doing uh, ERP and when group therapy may not be right for someone and uh, and then the usual sort of questions towards the end so I'll let you guys decide what you think of group therapy but thank you to Mary for doing this episode and without further ado here she is on the podcast today I have Mary Torres Mary is a licensed mental health counsellor based south of Seattle where she runs her private practice Cornerstone OCD and Anxiety. Welcome to the podcast, Mary. Hi. It's good to have you here. And uh, we're, get, we're obviously going to talk about um, ERP, but specifically in groups today. 
because uh, it's not something I've talked about in great detail on the show and I think it's, it's definitely worth covering and I know you do a lot of ERP groups. So, uh, but before that, it would just be good to hear your kind of therapy story and then what got you into treating OCD? Um, sure. My, what got me treating OCD was I went right into private practice after grad school and uh, we are associate licensed. So um, we take anybody that'll give us a you know, $5 for therapy. So I had, um, that original person who had OCD and I looked on the internet how to treat OCD and thought, okay, sure, I can do this. (laughs) And, um, quickly found out that, um, it, it wasn't as easy or, I mean, it, it's pretty simple, but there's a lot of intricacies to understanding how to treat it. And so, when I, and, and that client was so interesting and, um, had some of the coolest compulsions that even still that I've encountered. Um, but after I terminated with that client, I decided I'm not going to treat another person with OCD until I get trained. And I think I had to wait about nine months before I got into my BTTI, um, through the international OCD foundation. Um, but somebody in town, uh, told me as soon as you, um, go through the BTTI, you'll be full in a month. And that was quite true. We all know, um, the, the shortage of therapists, uh, throughout the world. So, um, very quickly, uh, filled up my practice. Um, also got trained to work with, um, BFRBs and, uh, took as many trainings as I could. So I've been to a couple of, uh, conferences and, uh, just signed up for ev- everything I could. And so I'm, I'm work with all of the o- OCD related disorders, uh, uh, BDD and hoarding, um, you know, all, everything. So my practice got so full, um, but I still kept getting requests for service. And I, I will see people on video. So I have people all over the state of Washington that I treat. Um, and so it was, it was a conundrum. What do you do when you're still getting, you know, requests for service every week? So I started moving people into groups. Um, and I, I forced them at first. So we would do a, you get an individual session one week and then the next week you're coming to group. I mean, I didn't really give them a choice. Um, and we've kind of stuck with that. Some people still stick with that schedule and some people are strictly going to group now. Well, yeah, no, thank you for explaining that and your journey. Uh, it's great to see that the BTTI was so useful for you and, uh, I think it's a great program. Um, okay. So yeah, let's, let's get into stuck into the groups. Um, so how does, a very broad question, but just how does ERP in groups differ from ERP one to one with a therapist? Um, I think uh, with my groups, I think there is a a support and encouragement, uh, maybe a little more bravery for mm-hmm. some people uh, to do it when they know that they're the people, other people in the room are supporting them. Um, And I also think that, uh, and this is probably one of the biggest points of doing ERP in a group is that everybody gets triggered, even if the, the obsessive thought that we're working on for that particular person isn't somebody else's obsession. So, um, just as empathetic people, just getting, just watching somebody else being triggered will get them anxious as well. And that's the beauty of it. Even, even if they're really relatively calm, um, just watching, uh, it's they're they're still, we can still get their suds up. And that, I think that's really cool. Yeah. That's fascinating. I never knew that. Um, but I guess it kind of makes sense. Um, yeah, no, no. Wow. Okay. So h- how does the exposures work? So for example, is it kind of one at a time and you'll, you'll say you, there's, well, actually, before we go into that, how many people roughly do you have in a group or recommend having? Um, 
I think most people who do groups would say anything over six or eight starts to get out of hand. Um, you can't really give enough attention um, it, as people are, you know, talking. Um, it, it just gets to be too much. You don't always get around to, to everybody getting attention. So um, six, seven is is probably where I would cut that off today. I have had people, I have had 12 or 15 in groups just because that was all I had to offer people for a while. Um, and those are, that's just too much. That's really too much. Um, but the, I have a, I have a couple right now. I have one that I just have two people in, um, and they're, they're really copacetic. It's, it's almost like just doing two individual sessions, but the other person watches and pays attention. And it's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I have, I think my biggest group right now is maybe six or seven. Okay, cool. And, and what's the, uh, sort of time frame? Is it still an hour session or is it extended? Cause there's more people. Yeah. Um, I was doing 90 minutes for groups, but I, to be honest, I need every bit of time that I have for more sessions. So Mm. I keep them all to an hour now. Okay, cool. Um, and is that our exposures done kind of one member of the group does an exposure, everyone watches, or is there a few people doing exposures? Um, does that make sense? Is it? Yeah. 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 Um, I've done, all different kinds of exposures. Um, and I have permission to share some of the stuff that we've done. Um, I, I told, I told some people this week in group that, um, we were going to be talking. And so we did some stuff, uh, just to give us some, uh, examples. Hmm. Um, but I do have permission for my clients to, to talk about what we've done. Um, probably one of my favorites that I've ever done, uh, has it, was, uh, I made paper bags and I put different triggers in each paper bag and we did sort of a game show type thing where, um, they had to pick the paper bag and whatever was in it, that would be their, um, that would be their exposure. Hmm. And I have, uh, currently I have a harm group that are only people who have harm OCD are in that group. It, it makes um, them a little more comfortable to talk about some of the more taboo stuff. Mm-hmm. And so this was in the the harm group. And so one bag was filled with weapons um, and one bag was filled with um, kind of pedophilia things like a baby doll and diapers and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and then one was filled with poison and gator, you know, Gatorade bottle Um, so the fear would be that, you know, maybe the poison got in and the person, it kind of worked out well because the person who was supposed to get the weapons got that bag. And, uh, when he looked in the bag, you could just see, he just went right to a nine or a 10 and, um, and you know, he just kind of, ah, it was, it was great. And so he dumped everything out and, um, I, we just said, which one makes you the most nervous? And so he picked a knife. And um, if anybody's ever seen OC87, when Dr. Grayson has the client hold the knife to his wrist, we kind of did some of that where um, he held the knife to my throat. Um, and uh, he has a tendency to get um, a really big adrenaline rush when he, he does an exposure. So after the exposure he just kind of melted and um, he really didn't have much to add for the rest of the group. But the, re- but the other people in group were just, just their eyes were as big as saucers and you could see the, the tenseness on, on all of them as well. So it was a, an amazing exposure. Um, and then I did one this last week where everybody was involved in the exposure yeah. and um, and we were doing each of their triggers. So one person has a lot of somatic concerns after a, tra- a lung transplant. And uh, so I had a guy who is 
concerned with over responsibility, telling him when to breathe in and breathe out. And um, then I have a person in that group who is afraid of death. And um, so I had put an ox pulse uh, meter on his finger and his pulse started to race and his oxygen went up and the person who was afraid of death, I kept um, responding every time his pulse would go up. And that person was just writhing around <laughs> thinking he was going to die. The guy with the responsibility, even though he didn't, it didn't trigger him that much with his certain responsibility. Watching the other two getting anxious made him get more anxious. And then the the guy with the somatic concerns, he um, he was really really bad. Um, and he, I, at the end, he wanted to go get a drink of water, and I wouldn't let him. Hmm. What? Well, okay. Yeah. Well, that that is a fascinating. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's it sounds like the kind of going back to what you were saying earlier. They, even if it's not their theme or themes, it still triggers them. So it's still an opportunity to, even if it's not habituating to a specific anxiety around a specific theme, it's still learning to habituate to anxiety generally. Um, is that kind of fair to say? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, and the, I think the inhibitory learning. Yeah, I think the inhibitory learning uh, part of of the treatment that we're doing now that we're adding really helps to understand that we are, um, it's the willingness to be distressed that is that we're working on. Mm. So it doesn't matter what's distressing you, even if it's not your trigger. If you're getting distressed, you are really learning that distress is tolerable. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Important learning. Um, okay, now that was fascinating. Thank you for sharing those those accounts and thanks to the clients for allowing you to do so. Um, yeah. Okay, so we, we've talked about. I know you said there you had a, you have a harm a harm group specifically, and you you, you by the sounds of it have some mixed themed groups. Um, is mm-hmm. that is there? Is it kind of just benefits to both of them, or is there? Yeah, I, I get a vague question, but I guess is it important to have the mixed or is it better to have, you know, one theme in a group, et cetera? So, yeah, that's a good question. Right now I have the harm group is running and um, the the main reason I wanted uh, to do that group in particular was I had a couple of people with pedophilia OCD and there's so much shame and so much um, secret to that. You don't share those thoughts, you know, outside of maybe with your therapist. And so, um, I knew that once those two people got in the group and would, were able to talk about it, that, that their lives would change. Yeah. And so it, I think that had so much to do with their healing and acceptance, um, that it, it, it was amazing. And actually, a couple other people who had never told me that they had pedophilia thoughts also started sharing that, yeah, I have to admit that I have those thoughts as well. So, um, that's, that's been a great, just having the harm group. And, um, so at the conference last year, I ran a harm group, um, and that went, went really well as well. So love, love that group. Um, I also run a BFRB group, um, because it's so different from OCD that, um, they really liked be- being separated out. And again, two skin pickers who had never met another skin picker really, really, um, enjoy that group. Um, the rest are pretty much general OCD. Um, but I kind of put people together who make sense. So sometimes it's just based on time of day or day of the week, but, you know, trying to add people that make sense together, uh, if that, if, if I'm making myself clear, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Absolutely. And is there any, do you try and keep sort of similar ages together or is it helpful to have a 50 year old with a 20 year old in a group? (laughs) Um, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting because my, I see people 13 and up 
And I tr- I've tried a couple times to get teen groups going, and I just have had the hardest time getting teens either to commit or um, or they just don't like it. I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but I but those teenagers will come to a, a general group. So um, it could be timing. You know, kids these days are so busy, so it, it could be that. Um, the... Uh, I have a few clients who are in their 60s and 70s, yeah. um, not very many. Um, most of my clients are, you know, range from 20 up through 40s, but mostly 20s and 30s. And so those that, that cohort kind of goes together well. Yeah. Um, but the teen, I do have a teenager that has come to group that, that stuck around. Um, and I do have an older lady who's in one of my groups who she's, she's, she doesn't act, uh, her age. So, um, Mm. she fits in really well with the rest of the group. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's very much on a individual mentality that more, more so than a chronological age thing. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. No, thank you for that. Um, and, and we have discussed this, but, uh, as as I write the question down or ask it anyway, it's just what are some of the benefits of groups? Um, benefits for me as a therapist has been able to see more people. Um, I just don't have enough hours in the week to see all the, the clients that I could. So, um, putting people in group has been helpful just as a therapist. Um, I think, uh, one thing that has been helpful is really it, it's kind of that conference spirit story, you know, when you go to the conference and it feels like a big family and, and everybody is just comfortable talking about their stuff because they know that they're accepted. And this, this group understands me and I don't have to edit myself. And I think that's a huge part of being in a group of people that have a similar disorder to you. So um, just knowing that, uh, even if you don't have the same kind of OCD I have, I'm, I'm accepted here and you get that this is more about uncertainty or anxiety that is really the foundation of what's going on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I run, I ran a camp in the UK last year, uh, which, which wasn't, therapy in any way but it was a support a supportive environment kind of being in nature and detaching from from technology and the what came out of it as, as I hoped it would was that uh, people who have met others with OCD and they'd never met a single person in their life with OCD obviously they would have but they they being you know two in a hundred people have OCD so they've bound to have come across many yeah. people with OCD but they just didn't know they did and now they're spending three days effectively uh with eight people with OCD uh and and that was kind of one of the most healing things for them was to be able to share and talk and each other support one another and to not feel alone and the themes almost didn't matter um they 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 shared kind of what they wanted um so yeah, it's good to, good to hear that, um, and it kind of yeah, it does kind of remind me of that conference vibe, where it feels kind of like a family. Yeah, I think that's you know, it, I have one group that I call the Warriors, and these are people who have either been with me a really long time, they understand ERP, they understand the treatment. Um, or they are in remission or, or management mode. Mm. Um, and I've, and we're working more, um, in advocacy. So, um, you know, the conference is going to be in Seattle next year. So this is the part of the group or part of my practice that is really going to be active on kind of welcoming people into Seattle for conference. And that group is, is amazing. They're super supportive of each other. They, um, you know, in a lot of groups, you don't always end up talking about the topic that you're there for. You might get, somebody might come in and have a death in the family and, um, we, you'll spend the time talking with that. And that's kind of the warrior group. If, 
if um, if somebody's having a hard time, we may not worry too much about the OCD. So it's you you get that family vibe, and I think that's you know if if people don't go to conference, they're really missing out. And, and I do, I feel like we get that, that vibe in group too, especially when a bunch of people have been together for a while. Yeah, that, that's a really good point. Um, yeah, I, I always say wherever people can find that community, OCD community, you kind of find it, be that a support group. Uh, I used to run a meetup, I don't anymore. Uh, that was just people getting together and hanging out. Uh, obviously, whether it's group therapy, whether it's a conference, um, yeah just just try and get around others um and yeah the more i guess the more you can see them which you would in one of your weekly groups the more you build that connection and that bond yeah hmm. okay cool so is there how, how so can I, I can imagine uh and i imagine this for people with social anxiety going into a group would be a nightmare for them um <laughs> and it's probably just not them it's probably other people as well but what was so, I mean, I never did group therapy, but I I can imagine at the time I probably would have been quite hesitant to it. Now I'm I'm not, but at the time I would have been. Uh, so, what are some of the like initial hesitations people express about doing ERP in groups? Um, I think I think you're kind of on to it when you say the social anxiety and not wanting people to see me when I'm anxious. Mm. Interestingly enough, before I started my first OCD group a couple of years back, I um, started a social anxiety group and I thought nobody's going to come to this <laughs> because it's social anxiety. Um, but that group was that it started off with a bang that I don't it was great. I had a lot of people in, in that group. Um, we did a lot of uh, kind of dares, you know, we try this, do this, say something crazy, you know, doing odd things with each other, um, doing game shows type of activities where you, one person stands up in front of the group the whole time, just things like that. So um, many of those people worked into the OCD group. I do think social anxiety goes all with OCD quite a bit. But I think once somebody's there, I think that kind of goes out the window um, when they see everybody's going through the same thing I'm going through. Yeah, really. Yeah, absolutely. And is that is that so if someone's really hesitant, do you obviously you don't force them, I'm sure. But do, do you kind of is there any kind of steps you have put in place of like just go to one session kind of and if you don't like it, you don't have to come back or. You know, is there any kind of small steps you put in place just to encourage them? Um, I think <laughs> my clients uh, probably experience things a little differently than they do with other therapists. So I am really, uh, I, well, I say all the time I'm very mean. Uh, and because I have to make them do what they don't want to do. Mm. Um, but my clients learn very, very early that I'm on their side and that I'm in this with them. But like I said, at the beginning, I forced people into group because I, I mean, they didn't have a choice, but I don't, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen a lot of people that are just unwilling. Um, I, That's you know, good. we have rules around doing exposures. I don't, you know, I'm not going to make anybody do an exposure, but there is a bit of pressure in a group when yeah. somebody else just did something to, to do it yourself. And so I think that's a great part of groups. Uh, but I, I think with my clients, they know that they're supported. So I don't get a lot of refusal. Yeah, no, that's really good to hear. And I'm glad, um, and yeah, like you said, I'm sure that's that you've built some trust with them and they're willing to kind of put some faith in you that you wouldn't be putting them in this group if you didn't think it was useful for them. So is there any is there anyone you feel that groups wouldn't work for, wouldn't be as, as useful as one-to-one? 
or any types of people um, or any people with maybe specific comorbidities or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, I would say, um, well, I, cutting is a, you know, can be a part of, you know, and a compulsion for people that non-suicidal self-harm cutting. Um, I would never do just a cutting group because I think it, it enforces it more than it, um, hinders it. Uh, but no, maybe I would, I might, I haven't started a BDD group. I don't, I don't know that that would be bad, but maybe something like that where there's a lot of, um, comparing. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I, I know there was a hoarding, uh, group um here in town back when I was in grad school we had to do 12 step uh class you know 12 step groups for our group class yeah. and um there was a hoarding group uh that met and I I went and participated with them and it, it that was interesting to watch a lot of people who were hoarding because um if they're still collecting things still acquiring things that that hearing about somebody else's acquiring can kind of trigger them to want to go acquire more stuff. So that might be something that I would watch out for if I was doing a, a all hoarders group. Okay, cool. No, thank you. That, that's useful. Um, and before we go on to some other questions and kind of leave groups, is there anything else on groups that you wanted to share or say, or you think would be useful for people to know? Um, uh, do them there. I mean, it's like I said, it's one way to see more clients. Mm. Um, I see people all over the state of Washington. So almost every one of my groups has somebody on video in, in the group. Um, I call it the old max headroom. You know, they're just a head in the, <laughs> in, on a video, um, in, in group, but it, that's worked out pretty well. I know you recently did a podcast about doing um, all groups, right? Or oh, all yeah. video groups. So um, that's something I've been thinking about uh, as well. Okay. Um, but do it. I mean, it's it's good for practice just because it really helps me to see more people. That's the biggest thing for me. Yeah. And the and the ERP ex, the exposures and the support that that of being with other people has been fantastic. For my clients yeah i can imagine that that yeah kind of knowing you've got others who are completely understand what you're going through side by side with you and you've seen them do it just before you or you know they're about to go after you is quite reassuring in a non-compulsive way um yeah yeah cool all right thanks for that so general question then is so whether in one-to-one -one or in groups what do you notice from your clients that seem to recover a bit quicker than those that don't recover as quick? Um, medication hmm. is, is always helpful. Um, and getting on the right medication, you know, get, I'm not a prescriber, but that combination is just helpful. Um, doing homework every day. Uh, is helpful. Um, reading the experts. Uh, I think Jonathan Grayson probably owes me quite a bit of money for selling so many of his books. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> but yeah, I know. When are, when are we getting our cut? No, no. Um, so, uh, but Grayson, Abramowitz, Hirschfeld, all, all these guys, I, I push their books, um, Shaolin nicely. Mm. They're, um, they're all helpful. And, uh, so asking people to read and, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a big reader myself. So, you know, I understand asking people to read is not always the best thing. Um, I actually wrote, uh, some workbooks for my groups uh, to, it was a 13 week program where we kind of touched on different 
aspects of recovery. And I think the people that, that do that work in between sessions get better a lot faster. And it's, it's not just, you know, 20 minutes of an exposure trial, you know, once a night, it's several times per day and, um, really, really focusing on, I am going to willingly go and do this on purpose and, and get my anxiety up as high as I can and not do a compulsion. Yeah. And, and honestly, I think really preparing people to, um, studying the inhibitory learning, uh, has been really, really helpful for me. Just explaining to the clients how the amygdala works, how the fight or flight experience works, and and what we're doing, and why why are we doing exposure therapy, you know, and um, that explanation of being willing to be anxious, and how that literally changes your biology is really helpful. I think one thing that has helped a lot of my clients too is um, getting out of this idea that this is a character or a willpower problem. This is not you have not having enough willpower or, you know, you're just weak. Um, it, that's just not true. And learning that this is a biological issue, that your amygdala is in control, um, has just been so invaluable for a lot of my clients to hear that. And it really works on those cognitive distortions too. Yeah, no, thank you for going into that. That's an important point. Um, yeah, no, no, great answer. And you, you somewhat answered my next question, but I'll answer it anyway, which is uh, just words of hope for those with OCD. I think for me, because I'm, I'm relatively newer to this. Uh, I, this might surprise you, but the thing that is so hopeful for my clients is there are so many people on your side. Um, when you, and I love the OCD conference when you go to conference and, or a BTTI or anything, uh, that's related to training and you see these experts that have been doing this so long that give their time and give their talent to, to us newbies. It's really, it, it has a big impact mm. on me to see these people care so much. Yeah. Um, we care it's, and your podcast or these things you are cared about so much. And, and if you could really understand how many people are are pulling for you that it would it would help you push through and just and just not do just wait five more seconds before you do a compulsion yeah yeah re really good words uh, of hope um and yeah just even in like i i agree with you what you said about the the clinicians that have been doing it for seemingly forever and still so passionate and still giving back of their time and um you know, really training the the, the up and coming clinicians and therapists is is important, and then the then the, then they're relaying all of that knowledge within, say, one of their books, which is such a gift to the community if they're able to get hold of that book, because um, they're accessing decades of research and information and passion and knowledge. Um, yeah. Okay, so a couple sort of general questions now which is uh let's say you could pick up the phone and call your 20 year old self what would you tell her <laughs> start earlier <laughs> um if you know i when did i finish grad school uh i was in my 40s when mm -hmm. i went to grad school and um i wish i had been doing this my whole life mm -hmm. i um, I'm too, I know people hate it when you say stuff like this, but I'm too old to go back and get a PhD. I don't need it. I'm fine where I'm at, but you know, if I'd started younger, I would have, um, I would have gone and gotten my PhD and studied under some of these people that are doing the research, you know, some like Baylor or, 
um, in McLean, uh, like I could have gotten into Harvard, <laughs> but, um, the, the research that they're doing hmm. <laughs> and, you know, I call them the big brains in these, these guys that are really, um, again, very passionate about, um, continuing doing this. Uh, and I, I think that I'm kind of working on this when I'm encouraging other therapists to pursue working with OCD. Um, it's a great business decision, but it's also really, really, um, nurturing to the soul to know that you can help people. Yeah. Yeah. Re- really good point. Um, I don't know, I'm gone. Um, ultimately I'm glad you, you decided to go to grad school anyway. Yeah. Re- regardless of age, <laughs> you know, I made that decision when I hit sort of 30 to kind of change career paths and I always always wanted to kind of be in psychology but I I let various things get in the way and then I finally made the plunge so it's, it's great to hear you did it too um okay so billboard you've got a billboard in south of Seattle or in Seattle wherever you want it uh what do you want written on that billboard for everyone to see I love this question um and I knew you were going to ask this, and why didn't I think of what I wanted to say? Uh, I know that this, you know, you always say this can be personal. It doesn't have to be about OCD. Mm. Um, I think if it's OCD related, I would say um, to understand that you're not weak, you're strong. I used to think people with anxiety disorders were weak people Mm. until I started treating anxiety disorders. And I realized it doesn't take anything for me to, you know, get out of bed, leave the house, go to work, drive to the store. I don't make any decisions in that. But for somebody who has an anxiety based based disorder, there's so many decisions made just to leave the house, just to go grocery shopping. Mm. And that's strength. So I guess my would my billboard would say you're stronger than you think you are. Mm. Nice, yeah, good message. Um, cool. So, is there anything else, whether it's groups or anything else we've we've talked about um, that you wish you could have said today? Um, well, mostly just thank you. Uh, I send so many people to your podcast and I know you won an award last year and I don't think that, I don't think that you can really fathom the, the impact that you've had on people's lives. Maybe you do, but it's, um, this is the rest of us, the therapists and the clients that, uh, that find you, uh, it, it's good stuff, Stuart. So thank you for all that you're doing. No, thank you. That means a lot, and I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I can't often quite fathom it. Fathom it. Um, uh, yeah, the fact that I even had to bring up in in my own personal therapy, like when I got the award, was like, what, "What's this about? I don't feel like a hero. This is completely like incongruent with who I think I am." And um, so, yeah, but yeah. I, I appreciate the kind words. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and thank you for you for what you're doing to the OCD community and obviously giving your time today and talking about groups because it's a topic that I wanted to talk more on. So thank you. So there you have it. Thank you for listening and I hope you found that episode useful. And don't forget, today's episode is sponsored by Unstuck, an OCD kids movie. So check out the website for information on how to rent the film. And if you're a therapist, you can buy the film to show all your clients Unstuck has given us a code to use when purchasing the film for your practice. Use code APR19UNS, that's APR19UNS, to get 20% off when buying the film to show your clients. And uh, you can check out all the information on ocdkidsmovie.com. And quick disclaimer guys, this podcast is not therapy, it's not a replacement therapy. Please seek treatment from a trained professional. Until we speak, take care.